Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Mr. Joe Bergamini, who's a drummer, educator, author, clinician, consultant. Joe, welcome to the podcast. Bart, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I uh, was lucky enough to catch your recent um, clinic and the, your discussion at the drum set committee at the most recent PASIC, which I just loved. I thought that was so cool. It was mainly about um, teaching in this crazy modern era of video. Uh, it was really important stuff. I loved it. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's I've been going to PASIC, the Percussive Art Society International Convention. Thank you. Yep. For um, you know, for many many years, and um, actually kind of relates to our discussion today. Uh, I, I built a lot of different elements of my career by attending NAM and PASIC, you know, just as a civilian, you know, so to speak, um, sure. kind of egged on by Dom Famularo, who was my teacher. <clears throat> and um, those first just going to learn, going to all these clinics, going to see uh, performances. And, uh, and then as I got more involved in the industry, starting to do presentations. So that panel actually um, I got involved with the drum set committee and my thought was so many people who go to PASIC are, you know, they're, we're in the trenches, so to speak, working, teaching, especially teaching. And it's like a, uh, for us, that's a professional development conference. Absolutely. Right. So I yeah. was like, let, let's make the drum set committee panel, you know, something that actionable stuff that other peers, you know, guys and girls can take home and, and put right to work. So they, it was Eric Hughes has been the drum set committee chair for a long time. And um, yeah. to, he's done such a great job. So he welcomed that. And, um, and then, so that led to me thinking about maybe I should do a clinic about, about teaching. I've seen so many great clinics. I mean, you go from all these amazing players playing things that are just in the stratosphere. I mean, you're, you're going to yeah. see the most, uh, you know, so I, my thing wasn't about that, you know, I mean, yeah. Um, but yeah, but it was ref it was refreshing to see that it was like a different take on uh, I, I don't know it was it was tools for your tool belt, you know it was it was actual uh, things that everyone can leave. Not that you won't, wouldn't go home and practice drum stuff if you're watching, you know, an amazing drummer. But this was like mm -hmm. uh, practical tools. Well, you you'll you'll go home from there wanting to practice for sure. But um, but I think in terms of like what's offered, they do a great job of offering all different things, and yep. you know it's important to offer those different things because I'm here to tell you, there's guys who can play way better independence polyrhythms than I can play faster chops than I can play. And, you know, it, you, that's great, but sure. it's only one thing when it comes to making a living playing the drums, it's only one. And <laughs> yeah. and actually you can make a living playing the drums without doing any of that stuff. Yeah. If you have other things in order. Sure. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, it's uh, and that's the beauty of PASIC. And I recommend everyone out there to go and check it out. Um, it's I'm lucky because it's only about uh, two hours from me. Um, so I could actually I actually went Friday in the morning and, and I had to come back that night because I was going out of town on Monday and it was a little with a baby with a two year old and a pregnant wife. It was a little too much. <laughs> so, I hear you. I hear you. Um, it, it was awesome. But uh, so um we have a couple housekeeping things to talk about first, but I just want to let people know today's topic. Uh, Joe has some some really cool books that we're going to be talking about. Stuart Copeland, Drumming in the Police and Beyond, and Neil Peart, Taking Center Stage, A Lifetime of Live Performance. There's that. And so for the podcast, we're actually shooting a video as well. So Joe's going to be referring to some video stuff, and we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to explain it as we go. Um, but okay, so the housekeeping stuff. I want to First, give a big shout out, Mr. John DeChristopher, who has recently been on the podcast as a guest, um, is just like, it, it's unbelievable. He joined up on Patreon um, pretty much right after at a level that uh, is pretty substantial where he gets uh, the tier is he gets a shout out. And I just love that because John is someone who I jo really enjoy his Live From My Drum Room series. I think it's just like important knowledge to be passing on to people. So uh, this is, you know, it's funny because it's the shout out, but it's not just, you know, some guy or girl. It's John DeChristopher. I mean, it's someone who really is, uh, as you heard on his episode a couple weeks back, um, he's just such a veteran of the industry. And I know you know him. Uh, what, what's your experience? Uh, with the, uh, first the great of all, John? I want to <laughs> say, Johnny D, thank you. Um, my brother, you know, it's funny. I'm a dyed in the wool Sabian guy, you know, endorsed yeah. 30 years, endorsing the company and now consulting for them. And of course, John, as the worldwide artist relations director for Zildjian, we got to know each other in the biz. And it was a classic example of just 
sort of becoming like seeing each other in the hallways at places. And yeah. then like, you know, John was like, oh, like I've seen this guy a few times. Oh, his name's Joe, you know, waving in the hallway. And then like, you know, I'm so happy with Sabian. He was at Zildjian. It was the great example of just, I didn't want anything from him and we just yeah. became buddies. And uh, I, the thing I, you know, not only is he a gentleman and a scholar, but, <laughs> you know, looking at what he's done since he left um, being the artist relations director from Zildjian, he just loves music and the drums, man. Yes. Uh, and, and, and he's, he's not only a great guy, but uh, I just, I'm, I'm in awe of his passion for it and was pleased to, you know, he's really good friends with Rob Wallace who owns Hudson music. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of um, podcasts and, and uh, been on his interview thing where we did it. Um, the Jeff Procaro biography, which I helped to edit. Sure. Um, so, yeah. So Johnny D's uh, one of the good guys, man. Love you, brother. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And just, you know, so, uh, live from my drum room is what people should check out on YouTube and the podcast form, which is kind of the audio version of it, obviously. Um, just thank you to John for joining up and uh, helping to support the show. Um, very, very cool. And then the second thing, which this is going to be a surprise to you, Joe. So I guarantee you don't remember it, but I emailed you in 2013 with a, I would call it now reading back, just an asinine rambling email about how I wanted to have a book and a video series with you through Hudson Music, where I had absolutely no, I was just out of college. Um, I was working as a drum teacher and I was doing these videos in this old warehouse that I do. I have as like a music space, just, just silly stuff. And, uh, and you answered, you know, this was, uh, what is that? Seven years ago, this, y you had a very nice. I don't think we can do this at this point, but thank you for reaching out. You were very, very nice. Oh, really? And I just wanted to say thank you for that. Because, again, it's just like basically a kid at that point coming at you with, why would I get a book at that point? Why would I work with the biggest distributor? But I just think it's kind of funny because now, uh, I guess, would it be uh, that's that, no, that was nine years ago. So so <laughs> I started the podcast six or seven years after that, which I think has been my thing and i'm fortunate it's been pretty successful uh just to keep working at it i guess is the the takeaway for me of like you know you again you were very nice and i appreciate that well, you're, uh, you're welcome i it's funny because um i'm i'm the kind of guy who you know i've been teaching a long time and i i i want everyone to succeed you know i want yeah. to see all my students and my peers succeed and and i love nothing better when i get a proposal from someone and we put something out through hudson music or or wisdom, like little company I have with mm -hmm. Tom. Um, but you know, you, the hard part is you can't say yes to everybody. Yeah. And, and the hard part is that, that, you know, this business can be mean, you know, like you don't, sure. you know, you don't get where you want to go without, you know, like me working with Hudson music is not, you know, I didn't, I didn't find an interview link on LinkedIn and get the job. That's it's the result of, you know, a lifetime of me working my tail off, yeah, just because I loved it with no guarantee of success. So, you know, it's a fine line with what your younger self coming to Hudson Music with your idea. You, it's okay to do that. Sure. It's, it's just how you do it. And if someone comes at you like in a super entitled way that, you know, hey, man, I'm the, I have the greatest thing in the world and why wouldn't you want to do it? You know, I, I can be, you know, I, I try never to be uh, dismissive or, yeah. Uh, but, but, um, certainly, you know, if you, I remember the first time I went to the NAM show and I'm walking around and, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm like, you know, I'm like a tiny pimple on the body of the music business. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm nobody, I'm nothing. Like I don't even want to walk into the Vic Firth booth and Vic's there with Omar Hakim and, and, yeah. you know, uh, uh, but eventually, you know, I think if you come from a place of respect and you, and you want to, so yeah, I get proposals all the time and, and, um, yeah, I do, I do try to, you know, we, we, Rob Wallace and I, we do look, you know, we do look at them, you know, we do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But you were, you were great though. And I, and I appreciate it. And it's just funny to look back too, cause I've heard, uh, Rob cook, you know, the great author and the Chicago drum show he's mentioned on some of his episodes, like when people send in proposals to, to play a clinic at the Chicago show, he's talked about you never want to be mean to people because you never know what they're going to do. And I mean, I, in no way am I this massive person, but uh, I'm happy that I looked back on that and went, okay, I was trying to get my foot in the door uh, that many, almost a decade ago. And, um, 
you were so nice that it didn't like shut me down. But but, it you know, I, I look back and I'm like, OK, that's cool. I'm glad I kept going and kept trying different stuff until one thing clicked and had kind of has become my thing. Um, mm-hmm. So, again, it's well, just you, you're a nice guy. You're very welcome. And, and I think the lesson is if you can't handle an, an occasional no, not getting the gig and a little disappointment, don't get into the music business. That's exactly right. Yep. You nailed it. Okay, so um, now moving on to the topic here. So you have written these two great books about one about Stuart Copeland, one about Neil Peart, um, and I'll let you start with whatever one you want. But I think just first off, uh, maybe Neil or Stuart, whoever, just how the heck did you get in the door and how did you start this process of writing these these books with these legends? Well, that's a great question. And, and as I look back, you know, the whole – this whole process of getting to be like sort of the drum book guy or whatever Mm -hmm. is um, it's really sort of an organic thing that uh, grew out of my, I think what I, my personality, like I have a certain um, when I, when I was first starting to play the drums, Neil and Stuart were two of my favorite drummers. And um, I'm that kind of like organized OCD person that I like to go in and, um, and dig deep and, um, and Neil's Neil's body of work really lends itself to that. Um, the lyrics and the, his setup, you, you could just tell the intention of everything. You know, pe- people yeah. will say, well, you know, he, he plays, he plays the same fills all the time. I mean, how could you, I mean, he, so much thought went into playing what he played. So, you know, it, yeah. it, is it, is it better? Is it worse because he plays the same fills? That's ridiculous. It's totally, no, you know, so, sure. I, you know, just, just the care and the nerdiness of his whole thing yeah. just Att- came yeah, it like came attention to detail yeah. and yeah. So so I, you know, I literally poured over everything I could get my hands on about him. You know, I I played along to Rush for 2 hours every day in 7th, 8th and ninth grade. I found a guitar <laughs> player that that he would he liked Rush and in my school Rush was like considered really nerdy, so like nobody else really liked them. I liked all the other bands, you know, Sabbath and Metallica and the Chili Peppers and Van Halen. But they would, you know, they would sort of make fun of me for liking Rush partially because they knew it like made me angry when they did that, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. So, and it just made me all the fiercer of a fan, you know? Sure. Um, and then I, I went and got, there was an early book called drum techniques of rush. Um, you can, people are trying to hawk it for like 500 bucks on eBay right now. It's a joke, but um, wow. I, I subscribed to modern drummer because, you know, my, Neil was in modern drummer all the time. Yep. And, uh, and I, I just loved trying to find out about him. And, and I was like, Oh wait, here, here's a, here's a VHS tape. Uh, exit stage left. Oh, you can see his drum set in this little, you know, we didn't have, uh, I know this all always sounds so like, you know, oh, back in the day, I walked uphill, you know, <laughs> yeah. two, two ways to school. But like, there was something cool about not being able to have full access. Like, yeah. I had to pause the video, you know, yep. to see like, oh, oh, and Xanadu, oh, he's playing the, the Tom there. I thought he was playing a Timbali. I mean, it was the, 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 you know, freeze framing things, wearing out the VHS and then, you know, waiting for a transcription to come in Modern Drummer. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've talked about it on the show before. That 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 uh, era, that that way of learning really always does add to the mythical nature of of artists where you have to like catch a, a little glimpse of them and you have to pause and you have to wear out your VHS tape because you watch it so many times. It it adds to their, uh, you know, godlike status, really. Right. So so I think nowadays the mystique part is very much diminished, you know, like, yeah. but, but the thing that's not diminished and the thing that's, I think the point of this is I, I, I did a mega deep dive into these guys that I loved their work for no other reason that I, I was just totally fascinated by it. And then uh, that eventually led to me, you know, I was like, I used to love reading along with that old transcription book and I was taking a few lessons, but really reading along with that book made me a better reader and, sure. and then I got fascinated with how things looked. And, and I was like, well, great. I mean, if they publish one in a magazine, I want to be able to use it. So I, I credit that with actually improving my reading. And then, of course, the next step was like, oh, well, you know, they haven't, they don't have, um, you know, uh, I don't know what, uh, they don't have, I'm trying to think, think of what song, you know, they don't have the Hemisphere's Prelude transcribed in this book. Yep. I'm, I'm going to transcribe it. And so then, then I went and just because I wanted to, I would go and, you know, learn how to transcribe first on paper. And then eventually with a computer program at that time, 
you know, it was the early days of finale and things like mm-hmm. that. And um, all, all of these skills I sort of like developed over, a, a, you know, the months and the years. And um, just because I, I felt like they were things that I might, you know, that might help me in my career. But moreover, yeah. in the beginning, I just enjoyed doing them. Yeah, yeah, which I mean, God, the the passion you have for something really dictates how much time and effort you want to put into it. Uh, exactly. Of course. I mean, yeah. So uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of coming around the long way to the, answering the question, but um, sure. basically, what wound up happening was I I eventually started submitting some of those transcriptions to Modern Drummer magazine, and I got published in Modern Drummer as you know, doing some articles from time to time. Wow. And and really enjoyed that process, and then. I was studying with Dom Famularo at the time, and Dom asked me to help him with his book, It's Your Move, which at the time was still unpublished. And um, so between those kind of things, I worked my way into getting a few things published. And um, I found it very empowering, not only because I got to see my name in the magazine that I was reading since I was a little kid. Uh, Yeah, of course. um, And I was just honored to be a part of it. But um, I just was like, wow, this is great. This Maybe this is another little income stream and I really like doing it. And that eventually led to me getting into um, the world of publishing drum books. Yeah. And, and, and so what fascinated me about drum books, so, so most of the time when I'm working with someone from Hudson Music, you know, they, they have a, a, a method book or a book about a topic of some kind. And, um, and that's kind of like the what I teach, that's the basis of my curriculum, you know, sure. after drum set method book, Gadamance, future sounds, the art of bop drumming, Afro Cuban, you know, all those classic yeah, books. Yeah. But um, that drum techniques of rush book just stuck in my head. And I just love that it was about Neil. And I, so I, I was always fascinated with these sort of artist driven, do a deep dive into the work of one person. And, um, and so the first thing that happened was, uh, modern drummer after I did the articles for a while when Bill Miller and Ron Spagnardi were still alive, both mm-hmm. wonderful gentlemen who really, you know, gave me a boost up in the beginning. They, they uh, asked me to, to do a book of what they called red meat transcriptions. Mm. And I'm going to hold up the cover. It was the MD classic tracks. Yeah. And this is just, it's just a transcription book. And Bill and I chose, Carter Beaufort, John Bonham, Terry Bozio, Vinny Caliuta, Phil Collins, Stuart Copeland, Neil Peart, Keith Moon, Steve Gadd, Simon Phillips, Jeff Picaro, Mike, P- Mike Portnoy, Steve Smith. Literally the like best, <laughs> I mean, well, the top tier drummers in the world. And, and we, we were, we, we actually said it was, it was the drummers that for Bill and I, the guys who, you know, we liked in the music that we listened to. If, if, if Bill did that book with, you know, Mark Griffiths, it, I wouldn't have been the guy to do the jazz version in the jazz version. That would be Tony Williams, Art Blakey, Max Roach, you know, Jeff Watts, all those guys. And if it was the funk version, it would be Zigaboo and David Garibaldi, you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, So, so not to say, you know, the, the, the the greatest of all time lists to me are just a total joke, you know? (laughs) Yes. Um, But anyway, you know, holding up a page again, I was able to kind of do a little bit of a, you know, write some text, have some photographs, and uh, I was like, "This is the kind of thing I wanted to to do." Yeah. And and so, uh, shortly after that, um, again, going to these trade shows and networking and meeting people. Yeah. I I I met another guy who's became a friend at the time. He was the uh, doing acquisitions for Warner Brothers when they were still doing drum books. Mm-hmm. And um. <laughs> I, I could just, you know, I'm like a wind up toy. I could just go into all these different, <laughs> anyway, this, <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. this, this fellow's name was, was Ray Bryce. I actually just saw him. I had a gig in LA and, and we, we reconnected and um, there was at the same time at that drum techniques of rush book back in the day, there was a drum techniques of Led Zeppelin and it was full of mistakes, like tons oh, of, boy. Them. and I had been bugging him. Not unlike, you know, you approaching Hudson as a younger version of yourself. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you know, we should really redo those and make them better. And so finally he said, you know, that's a great idea. And I redid the the drum techniques of Led Zeppelin book. Um, yeah. And for Warner Brothers. So, sure. so th- th- that's kind of how I got my foot in the door of of doing these kind of personality drum books. Which is important because, I mean... Um there's something very, uh, I mean, it's, it's a business. You want to sell books. You want to sell stuff. Having John Bonham on the cover of a drum book as you're walking through Guitar Center or Sam Ash or whatever, looking at that, you know, rack of books, I'm going to grab John Bonham. 
<laughs> you know what I right. mean? So it, it helps to have that biography level of it. And I like how you include the little blurbs about the drummer and the pictures and the fun stuff like that. So it makes sense that it's a direct, uh, it leads directly into doing the other books you did about Neil Peart and Stuart Copeland, um, which why don't you describe those a little bit about what they like a summary of them for people who may not be, uh, you know, know about them. Absolutely. So I, I had actually gone, I just, I just want to mention these other, I, I became the drum editor for a hot second for Carl Fisher. And when I was there, I wanted to continue doing that. I always wanted to do this thing. So the, these, you know, I, I did one with also with Scott Rockenfield from, from Queensryche called Operation Rockenfield. And then one with Jason Bittner um, called Drumming Out of the Shadows. And so I, ke- I kept developing the idea so that when the time came and I was, I met the guys from Hudson Music, I, I kind of brought this idea with me. And what happened was, so, so I, when I, when I, I always wanted to do those kinds of projects, but once I got with Hudson Music, I was almost doing personality projects every day because I came into the company and we were doing a DVD with Keith Carlock and Aaron Spears and a yep. John Blackwell, Steve Gadd. So I, the idea sort of lay dormant, but I, I thought to myself that I wanted to do it. Um, and, and I loved the transcriptions, but I loved like the drum set diagrams, yeah. and the text and the photos. So after I had been with Hudson for a few years now, I, I knew that they, we've established that I was a Neil Peart freak and he was my hero. Sure. After a few years of, of working with Hudson, Rob came to me and he said, I just met with Neil and he might be open to doing a project. Could you write a proposal for him? Wow. And uh, after I picked myself up off the floor, because <laughs> you know, the, the first five years I worked for Hudson or whatever it was, I never brought up his name I, because I knew yeah. enough about him to know that, you know, if he was interested in doing something, it wouldn't be coming from some unknown guy, you know, yeah. proposing it. So once, yeah. once Rob uh, said that, I immediately said, I want to make the dream version of that drum techniques of rush book. And I mm. want it to have not only the transcriptions, but I want it to have, you know, photos from every tour, the drum set diagram from every tour and Neil talking about the parts from all those songs. And, um, mm. and that, that's, that's basically what the idea developed into. So these two books, which, and I hope there's, there's more, I, I, you know, it's fun to do them. It takes a lot out of me to do them. I oh, can't, of course. I, but um, yeah, they're, they're sort of like, a combination of a of a trans a scholastic transcription book of a survey of the artist's work combined with a coffee table book of yeah. full color photos and biographical information, um, sort of like that's a great way to put it. Yeah, and 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 my dream was and and actually this thanks to Neil this happened. I I wanted to make it so that if you didn't read music you would just buy it anyway because there was so much other cool stuff in there if you were a fan. Yeah. And and Rush actually sold the book at the merch stands on their last two tours. Wow. Um <laughs> That's so uh unbelievable. But that was, let that me, was yeah. Let me ask you this. All right, so let's get into actually working on it a little bit. So so what was your experience like the first time you met your hero? Walking into a room and meeting Neil. Right. So um that could go on a long time. So before I get into <laughs> that, I'm just going to say that um it's an interesting position to be in that I'm really thankful to be in. And, I, and in no way do I, in some ways I feel not qualified for, which is when you approach someone, let's say you, it's fresh in my mind, approaching Stuart Copeland, you say, Hey, you know, we want to do something about you and we want to do a survey of your career and your work. And we want to document in transcriptions and, and Stuart, you know, uh, understandably might be like, okay, well that's an honor. Who the F are you? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, sure. And so the first step is you, you have to, they have to like trust that you're the right person to do it. Yeah. And um, so, th- so that, that was the first step of getting when that was the first, that's the first step in any of these projects. You have to make it clear to the subject of the book that, you know, they, sh- they should be comfortable with you and you're qualified and you're going to do a good job of, of documenting them. And now, you know, now that, yeah. I have a couple of things under my belt. It's, it's gotten a little easier, but even if I'm working on a biography, so I I had the privilege of editing Liberty DeVito's autobiography, similar task in, you know, every time I'm editing with someone who I look up to like that, 
I'm always like kind of testing the waters. Like, gee, did, you know, if I rewrite that sentence, is he gonna, is he gonna get you know angry at me? You yeah, know? Um, yeah. And hmm. it's it's you know like you just have to. It's like if you're playing on Broadway shows in New York, like you have to you have to come in at a high level every time. Sure, of know? course. Yeah, so it's the same thing. So and then yeah. and then if you establish that, then then they get your trust now. So you asked about how did it happen with Neil? So, yeah. So the first step with Neil was because he's so, he was so reclusive and was so um, private and Rob already had a friendship with him. Rob knew that the first step was, you know, let, let's get Joe to write a proposal and see if it even catches any interest, you know? So yeah. I, so I did that and I wanted it to be a survey of his work. I knew full well that he didn't want to talk about, you know, his thing back then was he didn't want to talk about any of the old parts. He was just tired of, you know, if one more person asks me, how do you play the drum break in Tom Sawyer? I'm going to punch <laughs> him in the face. Right. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Um, so sure. he, I knew he didn't want to talk about that. He was never interested in, in revisiting the past, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and that, which, which, you know, I always, I always found fascinating about Rush. You know, you had all these people who are like, oh, yeah, I like the old stuff. I don't like anything after Hemispheres. I don't like anything after moving pictures. I don't like anything where they use the keyboard. Well, they must have been doing something right because they filled arenas yeah, until exactly. they're very late. You know, they never became an oldies act. They stayed relevant. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think if any band is a band long enough, there's always the their first album was better or their, their last album was better pe- kind of people where that just comes with the territory. You know, there's... Right, right. No way around it. So, so I, so I put something together, and while I think Neil didn't want to go back and necessarily talk about the old stuff, like he, he sensed that there was a real love and knowledge of his work, and and maybe he would want to try to figure out a way to make it work. And I was pretty amazed by that because I, I thought he didn't want to meet any of his fans, and most of the time he didn't because, you know, he had, it was uncomfortable for him a lot of the times yeah. when that happened. Yeah. There's a lot of people who like, you know, um, you know, I've met some famous people who can't get enough of, you know, they're just give me more adulation, you know, give me <laughs> yeah, more adoration, give me. Yeah. Um, and they, it's a strange thing that happens to you when you're given that level of, you know, you can start to drink your own, own Kool-Aid quite easily, you know? Yep. Um, and Neil struggled against that. So, so Rob's like, why don't you meet Joe and see if you might be comfortable working with him? So Rob brought me to, um, basically he, he, he made my childhood dream come true. He brought me to a rush concert and I met Neil backstage (laughs) on his bus. There's nothing cooler than that. I I mean, mean, seriously, if my, if my life story with Neil ended that day, you know, I met him on his bus, Rob and Neil caught up for a while. And then he said, let's take Joe out to the stage and show him the drums because it was sound check time. Wow. So I got to walk in, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm walking in next to, and you know, Neil has like a bubble around him backstage, you know, no one can get near him. He's just sure. private like that. So I'm literally w- staring at him. I'm walking. I can't believe I'm walking in backstage to a rush concert, rush concert next to Neil Peart. And then we get to the drums and he's like, go ahead, sit down. Um, and wow. so, you know, we just started talking drums, talking shop. You know, and I can remember I sat down and I noticed that I, his seat height was the same as mine, even though he was like a foot taller than me. Yeah. And I said, you know, Neil, it's so funny. We have the same seat height, but all the rest of your stuff is too high for me to reach. And he's like, yes, I have a very long torso. <laughs> it was like, I was like, oh my God, he's just like, I thought he was going to be. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's so cool. Wow. I mean, and you're right about that bubble. I think most people know this, but you would know much better than me. But from what I understand is he he's not I think he fought the 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 perception of being a mean guy, but he wasn't. It was just more of a, I don't he, he was like shy. It almost came off more to me uh, of like, I don't want to hear about how much you love Tom Sawyer. You know what I mean? It was more just a uh I, he's not interested in all the fanfare. It, it wasn't a mean thing, right? Fair to say. Exactly right. And um, <clears throat> working with him, it took a little while to get to a thesis of the book that he was comfortable with. Um, you know, I could go on about meeting him all day. I've told the story sure. in, in, in other venues. Um, but anyway, he wanted to document his current way. His his brainstorm was, I don't want to talk about the old recordings, but if we can talk about the old songs and use the way I play them now, 
because he felt that his playing had developed, then then we can do that. So yeah. taking center stage, what it became was the documentation of his touring career with Rush and playing the songs live. And I went through every tour and documented the drum set for every tour. I reused his text from the tour books all in one place, got him to do wow. new interviews about each thing, but the transcriptions were of the time machine tour. And it was a perfect tour to do it for because they, that was a tour that they went from beginning. They did a retrospective, um, pit played moving pictures in its entirety, but so it gave me a chance to go through and, um, in, in his case, that's how it was. Now for Stuart and for anybody else that I would do the book with, you know, they, I don't think they would have that, um, issue or, or, you know, perspective that Neil had with yeah. Stuart. We used the classic studio recordings uh, yeah. of the police. Gotcha. So, um, anyway, so that, so that's what taking center stage was. It was, it was a dream come true. And, and in the case of Neil, we became friends. And so, yeah, which that's, I mean, it, it's, it's just everything is you got to be a good hang and no matter, no matter what you do. And, and people, uh, I mean, drummers are people and it, uh, they, they want, they need to trust you and like you as a person, which I think that's, you should be, which I'm sure you are very honored to have gotten on the inside and, uh, get that respect from one of your idols. I mean, it doesn't get much <laughs> better than that. It was, it was, you know, he, he loved talking shop. You know, it's funny. People think he wasn't, he, I could ask him rush questions. He, he never, he was fine with it, you know, it, as long as it was, if it was coming from, he, he loved the fact that I loved his work. Yeah. You know, I, I and, and he loved, you know, stories like we would trade drum drummer stories when, when I would tell him about being super nervous, subbing on a Broadway show or, you know, not being able to follow a conductor playing with a symphony. And I didn't, you know, he would laugh and just, he would love it. He couldn't get enough of, you know, and I'd be like, I'm sitting here talking shop with Neil Peer. This is, you know, yeah. but he, he yeah, was, but, you know, it, I, I mean, he probably, he probably enjoys those stories too, about, about real deal, uh, down in the trenches drumming, as opposed to arena drumming in one of the biggest bands in the world. It's, we all still like hearing those stories of like playing it. I mean, not that playing on a Broadway show is like a bar gig, but you know what I mean? It's, it's working drummer every night, hitting the road. He probably loves that. I mean, it's he likes those stories. He did love it. And I guess the last thing I'll say before we talk about the Stuart thing a little more is, yeah. you know, the, there are a lot of things that set him apart in my mind from, from other people I've met. And one of the things was that he had that constant – a lot of my heroes and my the guys I looked up to have a constant desire to grow and get better. And, and as I've known them, they have in, in crazy ways – I'll to name names, for instance, Steve Smith, David Garibaldi, John Riley, you know, three yep. of the guys who I looked up, look up to the most and have either studied with or like for all intents and purposes studied with, cause I did a book with them and I, you know, they sure. made me do stuff with them that made me get yeah. better. Um, Neil did that. And for a guy that was as worshiped as he was to, to see, he saw the flaws in his playing and he tried to address them and he, he was just trying to get better. And he, he definitely had a humble outlook on it. Yeah. Where, whereas, you know, I think most players, and, and I'm not saying one of these is right and one is wrong. You know, a lot of really big players would be like, you know, well, okay, so I don't improvise a lot. I must be doing something right. I won the rock drummer poll and modern drummer. <laughs> you know, it's like I pulled the lever and, you know, I won the jackpot every year. Yeah. I'm just going to do what I do. I mean, I think most people do that, you know? Yeah. You know, uh, and just as sure. an example, you know, Bernard Purdy doesn't care that he can't play prog rock, you know, <laughs> why would he care? You know, no, he's, he does what he does and that's his thing. And he's made a career of it. So yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. So anyway, he had that ability to, or desire to get better. And, uh, yeah. And I want to say too, that obviously I plan on doing a biography episode, um, on Neil Peart because I think everyone wants to hear that. Um, but I, I need to find the exact per the, 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 which I'm sure you could probably do it, but like it, it needs to be an hour and a half dev devoted just to Neil's childhood and all this stuff. So at some point that will happen on the podcast. Um, but so let's talk Stuart. I yeah. love Neil Peart. I love Stuart Copeland too, but I, I growing up, I just loved the police. I loved that islandy kind of vibe with, you know, the rhythms and all that stuff. And, and he has such an interesting background with, you know, the way he was raised. Um, so talk about Stuart a little bit and working with him and all that stuff. So 
you know, having Rob at uh, Hudson Music has, uh, you know, we both still have a really deep passion for all these artists and bands that we like. Excuse me. And uh, as we thought about, we, Hudson Music has documented so many amazing drummers. Um, m- when we think about someone who has the body of work and the interest uh, or, or, you know, detail of their full persona as a drummer, you know, we try to think of for a book like this, who, who has that sort of full package of like the vibe and the, and, and yep. so Stuart was an obvious choice because he, you know, he, he's just instantly identifiable. He, the band was, you know, his body of work was just so well known by everyone and so iconic and so different. You know, he's, he's sort of one of the signature people of his time. Totally. And, and, yeah. you know, he's like go, looking back now, it's, it's interesting to look back and see that, you know, the people who maybe you talk to rock drummers and you realize everyone was influenced by him, you know, yeah. other, other, yeah. other guys, you know, you're, you're hearing the same thing now about Alex Van Halen, you know, people like sure. he's, an, he's an unsung hero. Well, not anymore. Like every rock drummer friend of mine, we're all like, oh man, Alex, that's, yeah. you know, he's pretty sung, <laughs> but I, I do agree though, where he, Alex Van Halen is a guy though, where maybe, uh, he doesn't come up first in your conversation, but Stuart Copeland's interesting because I think he does come up first in your conversation, but he's different from Neil where Neil, you think of YYZ and this long solo that everyone has watched on YouTube 10 million times. But with Stuart, you think of his interesting rhythms and his interesting sounds and his style and just the look of him and right. tall and lanky with short shorts and that big kind of cushion on the side of his snare. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I have to say another thing was like, you know, watching MTV and getting glimpses of his drum set. I, I love the fact that he, like, I was like, Oh, look at that. He was, Oh, he has only one bass drum, but he has, what are those long tube things sticking out? Yeah. The octobons. What, yeah. what, what are those little things? He's got all these tiny little, are those symbols in the front? What are those tiny little things in the front? You know, it's like our instrument is so, you know, geared to your personality. You yes. Know? And I, you know, I, I love, it's cool that so many people play a four piece kit with one ride, the minimal thing. I get it. It's cool. I yeah. like a drum set. Like I love looking, going, you know, being at a drum festival and like Simon Phillips's kit, you know, you you read my mind. Oh, I mean, it's yeah. like, it's impressive. And they're all Tama guys, which you're a Tama guy. So, I mean, that has to influence a little bit of that. Yeah. You know, when it comes to my endorsements, Tama and Sabian, especially, but, but Tama, I mean, th- thank God they like me. You know, I mean, I really do <laughs> like them the best. I mean, I, it's pretty honest, bro. You know, it's sure. Um, but anyway, um, yep. so I, I, Stuart was always a favorite drummer of mine. I never analyzed his drumming as deeply and I knew I was in for a lot of work with this project because um, there was always something in the, I would try to figure the songs out. And I, I was like, wait a minute, like how, why am I hearing the snare, the hi hat and the crash all at the same time? Like something yeah. like, man, this guy's doing some stuff. I, I don't know what's going on. So I would, I would try to learn it. And then, and then later on, on certain tunes, like um, on synchronicity, uh, synchronicity was the, oddly enough was the first record I really dissected from him. Yeah. Um, some of the tunes where like King of pain or something were wrapped around your finger. Yep. You know, I, those I could clearly hear, you know, what was going on, but, it, but if I put on synchronicity too, and you heard yeah. that, you know, that like, I was like, wait a minute. I, you know, in passing, you're like, he's playing some hi hat openings. And then you go back and like, wait a minute, that's not, those are not, hi-. that's a symbol. He's choking the symbol. Oh, but yeah. the, the hi-hat's still go, And then it's like, how is this physically possible? I mean, he, he really is like an octopus kind of drummer where it's, how is this happening? <laughs> right. So what, so what I discovered, so we started getting into the depths of things. And the, so in this case of Stuart, um, we, we had, there's a process in reaching out to any of these, these artists that, um, you know, you want to make sure they have to see your other work. You know, we'll send them a copy of the Neil book and some of the other books that we did. And yeah. and I'll be honest, we, you know, I wanted to do this with Alex Van Halen too. Alex, if you're listening, you know, get the Stuart <laughs> book if you still want to do it, you know, um, <laughs> but you, you, you approach and usually you get a nice respectful answer. Sometimes there's no interest, you know? Um, so in the case of Stuart, we actually tried years ago and we tried again. We thought maybe with the pandemic, maybe he's at home and maybe he has time for us to interview him and, and it worked yeah. out. So, um, wow. So it was a different experience than meeting Neil. Like once, once he was into it, we had an initial Zoom meeting with him, and I started doing a lot of research. I started going back 
to make a proposal for her, I went back and listened to all the police albums and I made a song list. Uh, and then I tried to look at some of the other things that he had done. And, you know, we always have to send in a proposal. And we, and so he found it enticing. And then we had a Zoom meeting. And then in the Zoom meeting, I, you know, it was pretty wild because I got to be on Zoom with Stuart Copeland. Yeah. I still have the recording saved and you can't delete <laughs> them, you know. It's like it's like the, the the voicemails of my son when he was little daughter when they were little and my yeah. me on Zoom was Stuart, you know. Um, but <laughs> your and children I, and Stuart. That's, that's right, the that's most right. important thing. Um but he so in this in the case of Stuart, I was learning things as we as we went along. And of course the the, the book and you know and I'll, I'll hold it up for those who are listening on the podcast, you mm-hmm. know, it was the same sort of thing. Like I wanted to have historical photos and document yeah. his tours and it's just it's awesome uh, color whole, pictures i mean it's like you can sit down and just on your couch and read a drum book and look at these amazing photos and see his and actually i mean it's i don't know there's something that's that's something with the internet that you kind of like take advantage or, or you, you you forget how important it is to not just google image search Stuart copeland but to sit there with a book is pretty cool and like t- to zoom in is to Bring the book closer to your face. <laughs> right. You know? I, I, I actually think you hit the nail on the head. Like I, I imagine the coolest experience of somebody, you know, going through one of these books is, is like, oh yeah, cool. Like here's, you know, oh, a ghost in a machine. And yeah. They, and, and they put the record on while they're reading this text right here. And they, Absolutely. You know, and, then, and then with my, you know, listening, putting on the recording and listening along is I think the main thing I hope people would do. If you want yeah. to go down to the shed and, 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 and play some of it, that's cool too. Um, and so, so as a result, like just from a teaching perspective, my students, like this isn't the kind of thing where I'm, it's like you go through it paid front to back, like a method book. This yeah. is, this is something it's, it's something I wished I had as a kid listening to these guys. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like a, it's like a fun it's like it's it's like a combination of a learning tool and going to the Yankee game and buying the yearbook. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's just um, geek out and look at the pictures and and like we said before, these are both drummers that have very impressive, large, unique drum sets. They both have interesting, uh, like what's that thing? Oh, I've never seen that. You know, like the, you said, those little kind of tiny symbols with Stewart. It's like. You know, and then I, I like with modern drummer, we all love the diagram of the drums in the corner that has the list of uh, what they're playing. I mean, that's it's it's so much more than just I mean, we love the personality of these drummers and the background. So plus, it's just a really well made book. Just you holding it up. You can see it's it's a nice book. Yeah, they're 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 heavy and they feel nice. But, you know, you're making me think about, you know, there, there's a risk with all this, too, because you're excuse me there's a risk with all this because you're documenting the artist's work. So I, I had transcribed every little thing she does is magic by hand. And, yeah. and I started to, so the big thing about Stuart, any big fan of his knows like there's, he uses digital delay on the recordings and I didn't realize how much he used it as an instrument in the studio. Hmm. Um, and so as I was interviewing him, I transcribed every little thing she does is magic. And I knew there was a delay. I had listened to it enough times to have figured that out. And um, as part of our proposal, I sent him the transcription. He's like, I want to see, you know, because Stuart, unlike a lot of other of these famous drummers, he composes for symphonies and he does his own charts. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So he actually sent it back like a college paper. He corrected a couple of things in red <laughs> and then he graded it. He gave me an A. It's in my permanent. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, it's, in, it's in my scrapbook. He's so awesome. Wow. Um, but as, you know, we worked with him, he's he's wonderful and he, and he's, um, he, he and Neil were such good friends, you know, and they had such different personalities. Like Stuart will get, you know, right up in like, you know, and I told Sting not to do, the, you know, you get like right up in there. And yeah. um and, uh, but as we were going through and I was learning about his background, a couple things, learning about the delay and then being able to document it, he would explain to me what he did on certain tracks. And then I would have to go back with my transcribing team to reanalyze recordings, to try to make mm. sure we were getting it right. So for walking on the moon, he, he wanted, I said, well, maybe we should just write out what you actually played. And he said, no, that's like, I was hearing the delay and I was playing because I was feeling and knowing wow. what I would create. So I want every note documented. So you're saying that like, okay, so, so 
what he played, obviously, we all know that then the addition of delay would make it sound completely different, you know, through the the headphones or actually through the master bus or whatever. Uh, he would want you to document the sound with the delay. Correct. So so and by the way, you know, he he set up the delay would be going live like his tech. Jeff Seitz would turn it on. Oh, cool. So, so he would and he would get that back in his monitor. So he, he wasn't just using it as a studio trick and he wasn't trying to replicate it by playing live. It was actually being done by. So, sure. so what we did was I, we did it a couple ways in the book. The, the main way we did it was we have a special note head that's in parentheses that represents a note that was played by the delay. Okay. So because, Interesting. because they, because they overlap. So, so the, the walking on the moon chart, I was like, you know, Actually, Mike Sorrentino, my good buddy, great professional drummer from New York. I, I have I have other transcribers that I'll get to work with me now because the writing part is so time consuming. And yeah. why not share the the fun of these with my <laughs> my some of my good peers and the guys I yeah. really love working with? So Mike and I were like, this thing's gonna look like hieroglyphics, Stuart, you know? And he's like, I just want it to be documented. So sit down and 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 watch, you know, just follow it and you can see all the notes that are there. And then for some of the tunes where he did overdubs, you know, like message in a bottle has a ton of overdubs. We, we actually did two staves, like, like a, oh, like, wow. a like a grand staff so that you can see we're, we're like, let's, let's just make this if, you know, not, not an amalgamation of what you could do as a drummer. You know, there's other books that do that. Let's, let's yeah. actually say what, let's try to document what everything he actually did. Like yeah, geek, geek out to the, to the end. So it's like, here's the overdub line and here's, the basic line. And he checked all that stuff. You know, of course his memory has gone back 30, 40 years. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating because you listen to some of these albums and you, you, you may say like, God, that sounds like an overdub, but you don't know. But now that you're actually doing it, it's so cool to have it documented. Like, Oh no, it's an overdub. It, this is what he's playing. So maybe possibly it's not physically possible to do it all in one go. Whereas, like you're saying, where some books might kind of do like, this is what it would sound like if you smash them together. Right. It's really cool. You're like, you're like being very pure. You're like, yeah. this is what it was, which is awesome. The, like, so Hal Leonard has all those play along books out and they're really wonderful and they have sound alike recordings. So if you want a message in a bottle chart to play on your gig, that's yeah. um, paired sure. down to a five piece set with no overdubs, you can, you can go find that stuff. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, in, in all of these books, there's a lot of front material, like in Stewart's case, telling his story, uh, being born in America, but brought up in the Middle East, in Lebanon and Cairo, Egypt, um, really factored into his, his um, playing style. And coming yeah. out, coming out in ways that weren't even conscious to him, like it was just how he was programmed. And yeah. so when we started, when I got to the final, almost the final draft of the book, you know, he read through it and he sent me an, an email back saying, Hey man, you know, I think, you know, everyone knows I liked reggae and he told the story about it a lot, but he's like, you, you went way overboard on the reggae. You, you, you haven't documented my middle Eastern influences enough, hmm. you know? And it was like, Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I thought I did mention it, but I, I clearly, you know, so yeah, my, my, the fact that somebody like Stuart Copeland would, would trust me to, you know, you, you have, they have to be, you know, comfortable. And then sure. I, so I had to respond to that and I was like, oh yeah, I did. I did miss that. And I went back to the interviews and I watched them again. And, uh, and I, I rewrote, you know, he, he felt like there was a couple of tunes where he was like, you, you mentioned this as a, as a reggae thing, but uh, one was spirits in the material world. Right. So when he's playing here, you know what, I, I hate to do it, but um, so yep. like that, that, I'm hearing the snare, the bass drum as the backbeat, even though it's double time. And and I'm like, you know, again, that sort of like ska reggae thing. And he was like, in that case, you shouldn't say that there. You should listen to the baladi rhythm from Lebanon, because I think that was actually what was in my head for that. Mm. So, um, wow. so yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, and then let me hold, I'll hold the book up again. Um, again, because he was so into his gear, there's a big section on gear and, I wanted to go back and bring that, like the ads from my yeah. childhood, like old Peisty and Tama ads from, yeah. you know, we, there's all that research too, in addition to the, uh, to the drum set diagram. So, um, which I think, I mean, all this stuff, again, 
book. Let's just say that's awesome. Yeah. See, so okay, so Joe's holding up a diagram of beautiful diagram of his setup and just again versus you know let's let's say book versus internet what you're doing though is again putting all of this together where you can find ads of Stuart Copeland online but right. to have them all in one place that you're actually physically holding when you're you know not just sitting on your computer is a really important thing uh to see his gear and what he was using and and I don't think you need to be a Stuart fanatic to be into this I think it's uh you know and this is it, it seems like a good gift for like a, a drummer. You know what I mean? It was like, like, actually at Christmas time. I, you know, I, and, and I, I do, you know, I do sell them on my website. I do sign copies. I, I don't sell, you know, Stuart signed some for Hudson, but yeah, I was really flattered. Like people came on my site and, and it's Joe Bergamini.com. If anyone's interested, sure. um, it, you know, and ordered like friends of mine and, and, um, teachers and, and people I know, you know, ordered like Christmas gifts for their husband, Joe, can you sit, sign that, you know? So yeah, it, it is, it That's is awesome. that. And, and you know what, like, I, it's not to say internet research is, is I did some internet research. You of know, course. Like when I was looking for photos, like pe people, it's all of the ins and outs that go into actually putting the stuff in print. You know, I, I went and searched for photos and I, I was like, Oh, there are photos in existence from Montserrat when they were recording Ghost in the Machine. I found them online. Who took those photos? You can't print them in a book unless yeah. you get clearance for the photo. So like, yeah. I mean, every photo you see required, you know, if I wanted the old Tama ad, you know, that's easy. I know the guys at Tama, like, do you have an archive? Sure. They don't have everything in the archive, but they have a bunch of things in the archive. Hmm. So, so with photos, just doing the photo research for it, you know, and Stuart sent me to Jeff Seitz, his tech, who, believe it or not, texted me during while we were doing this interview, Jeff. Oh, He's wow. such a wonderful guy. And <laughs> and then and so, you know, Jeff went to Sting's tech, Danny Quattrochi, and, and Danny had those pictures of Stuart in the studio. Wow. Um, and so Danny helped us out. So um yeah, I hmm. I, I wish and, and hope that I could do I, I do have a couple more people in mind. I don't want to um jinx us and tell yeah. say who we're approaching, but uh yeah. And and it, like I said, it takes a lot out of me. So I, I don't know that I could do one of these every six months. Um, no, but, but it's an important, uh, let's, I mean, it, do you consider it like a series? You know what I mean? These types of books, obviously they're not really related, but I see if, I feel like if you do more and more of them, then you could have a catalog of these particular kind of artist spotlight transcription books. It's really, you know, you know they, I, they, they work together. It's funny. I, I hope this doesn't come out sounding corny, but like I, I feel like I, I've noticed as I've, you know, I'm in my fifties now. And uh, I, as I've gotten older, I realized, you know, I, I have a recorded body of original work. I haven't, you know, the two bands that were really forefront and happy, the man with these prog bands, neither one is active anymore. Um, and I still have an output as a player, of course. Sure. Um, but I've noticed my, my teaching practice, my teaching business is it's like, it's mine. I love it. I feel it's, I, I, I yeah. put a lot into it. I, you know, uh, my students, I take very seriously when someone invests in studying with me and, and it's like kind of a thing I built for myself and I, I really love it. Yeah. These books, and this is the part, I hope it doesn't set like, I feel like it's my, it's an album. I made an album. It's like my album. Absolutely. Did, you know, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. No, I think so too. I mean, it's your, uh, for you personally, I, I mean, I feel I feel the same way with an episode that took a long time to get booked and we did it and it was great. And now it's out and it's my baby. But it's the same thing where you did so much work on these books and you spent so much time with your heroes. And it's such an experience for you that, yeah, you should feel like that. I mean, it's it's great. I'll be totally honest. What Even with Neil or Stuart, like when I finished and the thing was out, I was like, oh, thank God, I'm not doing that again. You know, and then like, you know, yeah, so, you know, <laughs> six months go by and you're like, oh, man, I got to do I should. You know, and then I'm getting. I'm so lucky. I get, you know, emails from, from drummers and fans, you know, like, Hey man, what's your next thing going to be? The store thing's a masterpiece. Who are you going to do next? And I'm like, oh, I got to do another one. So, That's awesome. Um, but I, yeah. there, there's, there's, there's certain people that, uh, I think if you know me, you could probably guess who I would, who I would want to do it with, but there's, there's so many, um, you know, w one of the people that I'll say this one, um, we, we did Gadamits with Hudson mm -hmm. music and, um, we got to work. Steve did that. The pandemic was a catastrophe for the music business, but I have to say 
I don't know if the Stewart book or Gadamance would exist if it weren't for the pandemic. I mean, yeah. Steve was at home plant and he's given us this wonderful, um, for those who, who can see, I'll hold up the cover of that Gadamance. Yep. Um, so Steve was at home and he wanted to, he was just practicing and he documented it. And now we have this wonderful book. Hmm. Um, for me, that was a, another out of body experience because me, yeah. Rob Wallace and I were on zoom with Steve and Steve would make me play the stuff. It's like, yeah, man, could you just play? I just want to make sure it feels okay. And I'm like, you want <laughs> no me to- pressure. Yeah. I'm like, you- he said, could you just play it, man? And I'm like, like right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Oh my God. Like, you know, but yeah. anyway, um, we, we, we've been talking with Steve about doing this with him, you know, documented. Can you imagine Asia and 50 ways and, you know, yeah. and Spain, you know, all the stuff he's done chick and it's endless. It's endless. Yeah. Um, you know, then he went back on the road and now he doesn't ha- you know, have time, but I'm hoping that someday, you know, we could do a wonderful thing like this with Steve. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you're not, I, I was in the same boat. I used to do the podcast every other week and then I started doing it weekly and it, it made, it changed everything. And it, it, you feel weird saying that the pandemic made things kind of easier in certain ways or better like that, but it definitely, it ruined a lot of things and made things terrible. But I think you and musicians, a lot of us had to find ways to like make it work. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, there's benefits to it, I guess, to having the time to do it. You you Um, know, if you keep yourself moving forward, you know, I started teaching on zoom and Skype. Well, actually not really zoom. I, I kind of, I, I, I will admit I'm sometimes a little slow to move to the next platform. Sure. So, uh, but I had been teaching online for, for several years. And so when the pandemic came, I, it was just next day, everyone you're on zoom, you know, tomorrow yeah. zoom or Skype and it worked fine. I mean, I, I, I feel horrible for everyone who, you know, I, I hate that we, I couldn't play. I was, I was desperate to play make yeah. music with other human beings. I, but on the other hand, you know, I taught four days a week and I got to tell you about no one had missed a lesson all of 2020. No one missed it. No, everyone was yeah. just home, man. Nothing to You're do. You're home. You know? Yeah. It's like, can yeah. I have two lessons this week? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm bored, please. Right. For the love of God. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. No. And I think that that's, you know, the stories of, of people doing good stuff is great as opposed to, you know, I mean, everyone lost work, everyone that, which was terrible, but, um, so on the topic of work here, Joe, I mean, that that all is fascinating. And we should say rest in peace to Neil Pe- Peart because, I mean, my God, what a loss. I think that goes without saying that. Um, if you if you haven't seen at Hudson, we have a really nice tribute page um, to him. And uh, I wrote a, I wrote a eulogy and that's the only place I, I posted it. But um, if you haven't seen yeah. that page, maybe maybe go there. But uh, I, mean, yeah. I miss him a lot as a friend. Yeah. And as, a, yeah. as a, you know, as a drummer. Very beautiful. Yeah. So let's talk about you as we wrap up here. Um, you obviously said Joe Bergamini.com, B-E-R-G-A-M-I-N-I, right? There you Dot go. Com. Nice. Well um, so you play with the Duop Project. You've played with a ton of Broadway shows. I mean, you're just the definition of a working drummer who who makes it kind of in a with the books and the industry and you play. Um, just talk about you and what you got going on and all that cool stuff. Some people call it a working drummer. Other people call it a masochist. No. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I I, um, I started uh, playing on Broadway shows in 2003 with the show Moving Out, which which was um, still all my brothers were friends to this day. I still do a lot of stuff in this sort of Billy Joel tribute world. Um, and then I joined a progressive rock band called Happy the Man with Dave Rosenthal, who's uh, Billy's musical director now. Cool. So so Broadway led to a lot of other great things. I continued subbing on many shows. had had a lot of great adventures. Um, including subbing for Tommy Igo at Lion King, another, wow. another brother of mine who, who I love dearly, and Andres Ferrero at In the Heights, and a little bit at Hamilton, not too much. Jersey Boys, Kevin Dow, School of Rock, Gary Seligson, beautiful for Clint DeGannon. All, all of these gentlemen are like I'm honored to try to play as well as they can play. I, you know, I think I did a good job. I didn't get canned anywhere. Uh, so um, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, I. Uh, over the course of doing um, these shows, you know, you get other gigs, you meet great players. And so I, uh, I fell into at first subbing and then um, having the chair with the duo project. It's uh, five singers. They met doing the shows, Jersey boys and Motown and the musical director who's become one of my, one of my closest buddies and uh, guy I love dearly is uh, Sonny Palladino. I met Sonny 
subbing for Clint DeGannon at Jesus Christ Superstar. And then I played with him again, subbing for Jared Schoenig at um, another amazing drummer at Pippin. And so Sonny and I were buddies. And then I subbed, you know, Clint was the original drummer in the Duo Project. I subbed uh, on that gig. Uh, and then eventually it led to me taking over the chair full time. <clears throat> so, mm. uh, so I've been with them probably, it's going to be a decade before you know it. I think it's eight years now I've been at wow. the chair. Wow. And um, before the pandemic, we had worked it up to a hundred dates a year. And um, mm. it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really fun gig. You know, it's, it's such a far cry from what I got known for in a very small way earlier on playing odd meters and, you know, yeah, prog rock. This is all groove. Um, it's traditional doo-wop, 60s and 70s R&B, and some current, you know, more modern material that they sort of like revamp this doo-wop. One of the biggest challenges is we have, a, we have, at this point, we have four different symphony shows that we do. So, oh, wow. you know, huh. we've, we've, I've played with, you know, a dozen of the biggest, you know, I played New Year's Eve with the Baltimore Symphony the week week before Christmas at the Naples Philharmonic in Florida. Um, mm. Still a bit of a nerve wracking experience for me. I, I didn't go to college for music. I sort of learned it all on the yeah, job. Yeah, um, I'm sure. Wow. So yeah, so I tour with them and um, it's just a wonderful band of brothers now. And um, it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's, 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 I'm, I always wanted to be touring in a band and strangely enough earlier when I was younger, you know, I was mainly working around New York subbing and, um, you know, I had my chances to do tours. Never. Some of them weren't really up my alley for different reasons. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Now I'm doing it. And if you, if you told me That's when awesome. I was, uh, you know, when I was 20, if you told me that, you know, you'll be in your forties and you'll be, uh, playing in Beijing, standing on the Great Wall with a doo wop group, you, I would have said you're freaking crazy. But that's how it's oh, worked that's out. That's <laughs> so cool, man. I mean, you're you're um, you're the real deal. Um, obviously, seeing your clinics at at, at Pasic and stuff, uh, and and but you're all about the next generation. I think it's it's fair to say about teaching and spreading it on uh, to the to the future generations. And one thing I think too, it's just neat is you're, I've, I've seen you around a few times and your son is usually with you, yeah. <laughs> which I think is super cool. And he see, I, I didn't get a chance to meet him, but he seems like a nice guy. Oh, thank um, you. His name's, yeah. his name's Nick. And, um, you know, he's always been around the drums. Just, I, I, you know, honestly, I like, I, I wouldn't, I'm so lucky. I mean, I, I'm a workaholic. I mean, I, my work ethic would probably kill a lot of people. I, I just, I have to always be doing something. Um, so what I do, I think is, I don't give up on things easily and I, and I work really hard and, but I love it. I'm having fun. And my yeah. son, you know, Nick's been around this his whole life and he, we just, he likes, it's so funny. I'm like, Nick, you got to listen to some younger bands, man. He listens to all the same stuff I do. Genesis <laughs> and Toto and Rush and the police. And, you <laughs> yeah. know, he does listen to younger stuff, but of course, sure. it, it kind of like, I got to say, as he became in high school and he got more and more into drumming, it kind of crept up on me. He's like, yeah, I want to, I want to do what you do pop, you know? And I was like, Oh man, like I never pushed him to, you know, I never said to myself, you know, my boy's going to do what I do, you know? Yeah. So the fact that he's gravitated towards it, I, I just, it's so awesome, you know? And yeah. So now we go, you know, he's in college for music. He's, he's playing, he's working his way up. He's um, doing some other things, you know, in the industry with, with, you know, me and my other companies to learn those things. And um, yeah, you know, we went to see Genesis play um, this farewell tour that they did. And uh, Phil Collins, sadly, is not playing drums anymore. Yeah. He sits in a chair at the front, but his son, Nick, is the drummer. And Nick is a beast. He's just so good. He plays so great. And so I'm there with my son, Nick. And Phil, you know, at the Genesis show, when Nick plays the hard stuff and like Firth of Fifth and behind the lines, he just turns around. And he just looks at his son and you can just feel the pride. And I'm there with my son. And it's just like, that's awesome. It was the best dad son thing. So when we go yeah. to basic, you know, it's like, you you know, all the guys like Nick is one of the cats now. All my friends, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny because he sat in with the duo project. He did it at one of our gigs. Sonny and the guys are so great. They're like, oh, you can't do the gig. Send Nick, you know. So wow. he sat in and Sonny had been waiting for like a month to do this. And he's like, you know. They say there's to the audience, he's like, they say there's these stages of a musician's life, you know, 
four stages of the drummer's career. Stage one, who's Joe Bergamini? Stage two, get me Joe Bergamini. Stage three, get me a young Joe Bergamini. And stage four, <laughs> yes. who's Joe Bergamini, right? So he's yes. like, we're in stage three. Here's Joe's son to come out and play. That's you hysterical. Know? Yes. So uh, that's so funny. But I mean, you have like a built in drum buddy now. Nice. I mean, you know what I mean? Like that's, and my, my son is two, but of course I have a little Ludwig set for him. And like, we have the piano and guitars. And when he sits down, puts his little headphones on and s- starts playing and just screaming the ABCs. It's like, yeah, you know, he can do whatever he wants. He can be, a, you know, a, an accountant if he yeah. wants. But I'm like, of course, I'm like, yes, play the drums. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's I think, you know, t- with teaching with my son, it's magnified. But, you know, I've, I've had the honor and, and, and responsibility, really, of teaching many people who I, they came to me in, in sixth, seventh, eighth or ninth grade studied with me all through high school and want to be drummers. And many of them are, you know, I'm proud to say, but, um, you know, I always feel that it's not easy to do this, you know? No. And and so I feel it magnified with my son, you know, I think he's going to be okay. I, it's, it's, I, I think in a lot of ways, it's been on my mind that, um, some of the things that I did to make my mark that I described in this very interview are, are, are not, they don't produce income now. Ma- magazines, you know, writing, Modern Journal would send me a check for a couple hundred bucks every time I wrote an article. So th- there, there's ways I think to do it that I don't know because I'm not the younger generation, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they have to figure out what, what those ways are. And, and, and I, as a, I'm, I'm skeptical of some of the things I hear. Um, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong about some of them, you know, like, you know, if, if you post all your videos on, on the internet, you know, for free, you'll make a lot of money from the ads. Uh, uh, nah, I, you know, I, I mean, there's probably someone listening to this that says, you know, you're a nitwit. You can get rich doing that. Okay. I don't know. I mean, I'm from being, I don't know, doing the podcast and now trying to get more into YouTube. I can say kind of like, you know, I guess uh, bluntly or whatever, you can make some money, but it, it takes a long time. You have to have a thousand subscribers and you have to have, I think, 10,000 views before you can even make a dollar. Right. And then you have to make a hundred dollars before they'll even send you a check. I mean, it is not like oh, I'm going to put up all my videos and then I'm going to quit my job. It's like right. Well, no. You know, I, I guess the point is this: not not for me to be an old guy and say what works and doesn't work, but what the I guess my version of you know going to the Nam show and going to Pasic and networking and meeting people and trying to figure out different income streams and trying to learn what produces income and trying to drum up work and going out and recruiting students. And all, that is none of that's changed. Maybe the, no. maybe the way you do it has changed, but, um, and, 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 and it might be a little, it might be a little harder, you know, yeah. like they say, yeah. if you teach on zoom, the world is your potential, uh, student base. That's, that's great. Maybe it's not so great that those same people can evaluate taking lessons instead of with the younger new person. They can go to, you know, anyone. Dave Weckl. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. Well, actually, that's a good point there. So so uh, on the taking of online lessons, you teach online lessons. So you can you're obviously if someone listening to this show wants to take a lesson with the great Joe Bergamini. <laughs> How do they go about doing um, that? So I, I have a, if you go onto my website, which you mentioned before, um, I just have a little link there that sa- uh, it says you can message me and there's one that actually says lessons. And uh, okay. I get those, they, those emails come right to my personal email. And um, I'm, a, I'm a little booked these days, but I always find ways to fit people. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, no, and I think it's important. And, and, and obviously you're a very, uh, well-versed teacher who I think can can get people and you have a really nice setup folks listening on the podcast yeah. can't really see it but you have a beautiful setup with multi-cam you know operation and and all this stuff so you're you're getting the uh, highest quality um, experience from what I can tell oh, I appreciate that and and I do, I do do you know in, in addition to the traditional weekly drum lesson thing I, I do get asked a lot to do um, career consultations or even just people who want to learn about the publishing business or all the other things I do, they'll book, you know, a session for an hour or two or a couple, you know, you don't, there's no needing to commit to like any kind of thing, you know, if, yeah. um, so, uh, and, and yeah, yeah. So I, you know, if somebody's like, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, I want to play Broadway, I'll, I'll book a lesson with Joe, you know, that, that something like that requires me to, you know, I can't tell you if you have a chance until I know a lot about how you play. 
Yeah, uh, sure. So that so that's not you know there's. FYI, there's no secret. <laughs> yeah, ain't no secret. It's hard work. It's work. Yeah, it's work. That's well, the same thing with anything you're doing. Is it's it's hard work. Yeah. Um, but thanks for mentioning that. I, I appreciate it, Bart. Yeah, absolutely. And Joe, before we wrap up here, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, Sabian Education Network, um, which I know you're very involved in and proud of? Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, a few years back, you know, after sort of getting known with all the educational things I do and having done a lot of clinics and. Um, Sabian having supported me through all that for many years, um, they invited me, they, they, it's been, you know, sort of known. And I think maybe Sabian might've done some, some research to really, uh, show it, um, uh, clearly that drum teachers have a huge influence, pro- probably bigger than any endorser on all the people they teach. And, um, Sabian being a company that supports edu- education, wanted to create some kind of place for the teachers to come together and, um, and gather. And, and, you know, they invited me to kind of try to design something for that. Yeah. And uh, I kind of envisioned going to my first basic shows and meeting up with all these different drum teachers. You know, I had a couple of friends and they had a couple of friends. And next thing you know, we're in a bar having a beer in Nashville. And, and we're like, Hey man, you know, oh, what's your name? Oh, I'm Steve. I live in Seattle. Like, Oh man, what do, what do you use to teach beginner jazz? Well, I, I used to do the Chapin book. Oh, oh yeah, but that's kind of hard. What do you, you know, your chest, yeah. you know, my student canceled on short notice and I lost money. What did you, you know, Oh, you got to have a policy, you know, like yeah. talking about running a business, recruiting students, what books to use. And I wanted to replicate that. So we've been at it for a few years now. It's thousands strong. It's called the Sabian Education Network. Um, if you teach drums, you're welcome to join. You don't have to, you, you should be a bona fide teacher, but you only, if you only have one or two students, you fill out a little application. You can go to um, Sabian Ed. So it's Sabian, S A B I A N Ed, like education, Sabian Ed.com. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a little application and, um, you have access to like a forum and uh, online resources, a members only website. And we do, we do some live streaming that's public, but we've been doing a lot of private classes. Like yesterday, uh, Dom family, Dom Familiaro and I did a class about um, using drum books and developing a curriculum. It was actually part three, but I've done classes for drum notation and finale. I've had David Garibaldi and other huge endorsers do private courses. So it's a, uh, awesome. yeah, it's kind of a club for lack of a better word for drum teachers. You don't have to yeah. be a Sabian artist or exclusive player to join. It's just there to kind of um, spread the love um, among teachers. So Sabianet.com is the Sabian Education Network. I'm kind of the Pied Piper of it. So if you want to follow yeah. me over the cliff, come on and, and, and enjoy. <laughs> That's um, awesome. Joe, uh, all right, so this has been awesome, and um, everyone listening, Joe is going to be kind enough to take a couple extra minutes after we wrap up uh, the main episode and record a little Patreon bonus episode where we're going to talk about, uh, you know, tips and tricks on being a working New York drummer, which I think, you know, we haven't done that yet, but I'm assuming those those tips and tricks can apply to a drummer in Cincinnati or a drummer in, uh, you know, wherever, um, Nashville, Mm -hmm. a big city, a small city, anywhere. So, um, Joe's going to do that. If you want to hear those episodes, you can go to drumhistorypodcast.com and click the Patreon link and uh, two bucks a month and up um, all the way up to the the higher tier, like my friend, the great John to Christopher, <laughs> who's, who's awesome and helped out. But um, yeah, Joe, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor to meet you. Uh, and thanks again for being nice to 22 uh, year old me. And uh, when I sent you a absolutely ridiculous email trying to be to make a book when I had no uh, <laughs> reason to do so. So, um, Joe, thank you for being here and taking the time to do this. It's been my pleasure, Bart. And, uh, and, and your, your, your younger self is welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>